Carolyn Warner has been active for more than three decades in public policy and education. She is knowledgeable, greatly respected, and a true icon in education. I have been around for a long, long time. I tell people I'm as old as dirt. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a very basic elementary fact of life, is that we have to have that to live. Well, I've been connected with education from birth. My mother was a school teacher. My father was a school teacher. He was also a state senator back in Oklahoma, which is where I come from. And Virtually all of my aunts and uncles were teachers, administrators, school board members. So education in my family was closely akin to being a religion. It was sort of a manifestation of our theology because we believe that everybody can, given the opportunity. After you finish recording all of this That's what public education in America has always been. It has been the provider of opportunity for just ordinary young people, ordinary children, to develop and to become extraordinary citizens. And that's what leadership is all about, being given the opportunity. You're not born a leader. It's not a gene that is passed on from one generation to another. It is the opportunity to manifest your own personal skills in such a way that others admire you, uh, respect what you do, want to follow, particularly if it's good, if you're making a difference and it's, a, it's an observable difference. And that's how we develop leaders. Miss Warner has certainly made a difference and she is a leader among leaders. She served three terms as Arizona State Superintendent of Public Instruction, the first non-educator ever to hold that position. In order to uh, fertilize the future, why don't we say a few more positive things about the past and close with that statement saying we reaffirm. You know, we're this, we have this conference on uh, confidence in education. My goodness, the other institutions in our society have done nothing, nothing comparatively. Schools have been all of it. In 1986, she was her party's nominee in a competitive race for governor. Evan Meekham was my Republican opponent and a friend, a person that I, that I enjoyed campaigning with and against. Uh, not vituperative, not ugly. We liked one another. Uh, but Evan Meekham would always say the best thing anybody could hope for is one Republican running against two Democrats. <laughs> and he was, of course, right. Today, she continues to serve on numerous national and state level boards with an emphasis on services to schools and affordable higher education. As far as being a leader in education, she captures people's attention and helps motivate motivate them. Um, she pushes for what's right in education um, and so I, I don't think you ever want to underestimate the positive impact that she's having in education whether she's out front running for office or whether she's uh, working on boards and and helping uh, administrators get legislation through or helping market what we do. I had uh, many many years in state office as state school superintendent that were such rewarding years. All of us in education in the state worked together and we did great things for kids. We were at about um, uh, somewhat above the national level on all of the measurable norms uh, in the area of excellence. We were there in teacher salaries, we were there in student achievement, we were there on all the tests, uh, we were there on the numbers of days per year that the children were in school. We had, we had fun and we had a good time and our students learned. Um, and we had much success in Arizona as a state in developing leaders and you see them today.
it just captured my attention the first time that she was introduced and you know she had like I think six kids and um, she had this hobby of non-traditional of fixing up old cars, Packards, and, and that just kind of captured my attention. And then, in addition to that, I mean, she was superintendent of public instruction, but she was also putting together books on public speaking and uh, doing positive things for your schools, things that administrators could do to promote and market education. Carolyn Warner has written several books, and in one, she compares public education in America to the Statue of Liberty. That statue holds up a torch of liberty, but liberty is equated with education. If you are educated, you can do almost anything you want to do. If you're not, you can't. If you're not, you're a prisoner of your own lack of education. So it is not just a lighthouse, but it is a community manifestation of the Statue of Liberty and what that actually means to America. And. Um, when we, when we think about the opportunities that America provides to and has provided to all of those immigrants coming into this country, and we think about the opportunity provided by the public school to all of the children in America over all these generations, they truly equate. And that's why everybody owns the schoolhouse. It's their future. It's their opportunity. She is a, a renaissance woman and in a non-traditional manner which which I found motivational. She motivates, leads, and inspires and the hallmark of her administration has always been a lifelong commitment to education. She sure has made it a lifelong commitment. You might not people might not hear her name as much as, as uh, in the earlier years as I was uh, involved in education and growing up, but she is behind the scenes. And she is working, on, she has been on a commission, or excuse me, on the board for um, the Arizona Education Foundation. So she's a big supporter of that, of, of um, Teacher of the Year recognitions and supports, the A-plus programs looking at, at schools and, and programs that are stellar. Uh, she works um, behind the scenes in helping keep education and, and teachers getting the recognition that they deserve. If you look at the amount of time that is spent in a classroom in teaching and learning, opposed to all of the forms and requirements and all of the details that teachers and administrators must do, it's amazing that our students learn anything at all or that our teachers have time to teach. I honor them for what they do and how well they do it. Once again, in dealing with equity, we dealt with it here first, and the schools were the primary movers. The same is the case in women's equity. It is the schools. What's close to my heart uh, uh, about education in America is that just because you do not have children in school now, uh, maybe you have reared your children and they're all grown and gone. That does not mean you can now turn your back on public education. You have to be certain that the students in school today receive a quality education so they can get a quality job, so they can earn a good income, so they can pay into Social Security, so that your Social Security payments will be coming regularly as you expect. It is, it is a continuum. Uh, it is a thing called reciprocity. You were provided your education by somebody. You didn't do it. And you then have the opportunity of having had children or family or young people that have received an education that probably you didn't pay for. And therefore, those yet to come are entitled to your continued support because it is the cycle that goes on and on and on. And as we support our young people, so in turn as we get older and, uh, and need Social Security, then they are the ones that have the jobs that are paying into Social Security to help us. So it isn't a, your children are in school and they're out and that's it. It's a continuum. It goes on and on.